Dean. Oh, finally, at last. Now we hope that Dina may start introducing Joel. Dina. Okay. Thank you, Latha. Thank you, Alessandro. And welcome everybody for our uh, webinar today. And uh, I'm really very delighted to introduce Professor Joel, Joel Koppel. And uh, the first time I met Professor Joel Koppel was many, many years ago, actually, and it was in the IFKF meeting in uh, Mainz in Germany. And this was many years ago. And he was not just the father of the IFKF and the word kidney day, but he was the father of everyone, taking care of everyone and every detail uh, since the day I met him. And um, I truly, I will take a very long time introducing Professor Koppel. And Professor Koppel, he is an American professor, physician, clinical investigator in medicine, nephrology, nutrition, and public health. He's an emeritus professor at the David Jiffin UCLA School of Medicine and the UCLA Fielding School of Public Health. He's also known as the father of the field of renal nutrition. Uh, uh, professor Koppel research focus has been in amino acid, protein metabolism and nutritional disorders and their management in kidney patients. He has authored and co-authored many hundreds of peer-reviewed manuscripts and invited papers and chapters. He's an editor of many proceedings and symposia and an editor of the textbook entitled Nutritional Management of Renal Disease. Professor Kuppel has found, founded the International Society of Renal Nutrition and Metabolism, the International Federation of Kidney Foundation, the World Kidney Day, and served a central role in founding others, other institutions. He served as the president of the National Kidney Foundation, the American Society uh, of Parental Enteral Nutrition, the ASPEN, and serve several other professional scientific society. So we um, we have the, all the pleasure to uh, welcome Professor Cooper, who will be speaking to us today about the routine energy wasting in the chronic kidney disease patients. So does nutritional support affect clinical outcome in chronic kidney disease and end-stage renal disease patients? Professor Kuppler. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Dr. Abdelatif, and also uh, Ms. Kuma Sarami and uh, uh, Professor Balducci. Uh, it's a real pleasure and, uh, and a privilege to be here. Um, the, uh, I'd like to start with a case report. A, um, this is a 62-year-old woman who has been undergoing maintenance hemodialysis for eight years and was admitted to the hospital with fever, chills, and a methicillin-sensitive Staphylococcus aureus bacteremia. She has a past history of diabetes mellitus for 25 years, hypertension, and peripheral vascular disease. She's a 30-pack year smoker with symptomatic chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. <clears throat> the woman appears depressed and describes poor food intake. Inadequate intake of protein, about 0.4 gram protein per kilogram per day, 15% high quality protein, and calories, 10 kilocalories per kilogram per day, is confirmed by her dietitian. The patient describes an unintentional weight loss um, of five kilograms during the past six months. The um, on examination, it turns out her body mass index is 20 kilogram per meter squared. Uh, serum albumin is 2.8 uh, grams per deciliter. Her prediolysis serum urea, nitrogen, and serum creatinine are 58 and 65. Two-hour postprandial serum glucose 140. LDL cholesterol um, is uh, 160, uh, not on lipid-lowering agents and high sensitivity C-reactive protein, 10 milligram per deciliter. Her subjective global assessment score is three. 
uh, where seven is uh, very normal, very healthy, and one is um, the poorest. Uh, so some questions. Does this patient have protein energy malnutrition, protein energy wasting? Both credit protein energy wasting and protein energy malnutrition or neither protein energy wasting nor protein energy malnutrition. Uh, the next question is, uh, what is the rationale for the, uh, this, the uh, selection that you make? Uh, third question is, is nutritional support likely to clinically benefit this patient in terms of reducing protein energy wasting or malnutrition? Uh, and in terms of this patient's survival, will nutritional support, um, is it likely to have any effect? Which of the following maneuvers would you use to treat this patient? And list the order in which you would apply them. Dietary counseling, enteral nutrition, uh, including tube feeding, food supplements, intradialytic parenteral nutrition, total parenteral nutrition. Uh, um, and this uh, 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 so let's start by asking the question what is protein energy wasting uh, PEW is defined as the loss of somatic and circul circulating body protein and energy reserves the term protein energy wasting is used rather than protein energy malnutrition because some causes of protein energy wasting are unrelated to inadequate nu nutrient intake. Um, these would include, for example, losses of protein, the presence of inflammatory diseases, which cause a catabolic response with net uh, protein degradation. So not every cause of wasting and loss of protein and energy uh, uh, reserves um, is due to inadequate intake. And this is the reason why this term protein energy wasting was introduced. Now, a consensus conference was held a, a number of years ago, and um, it was decided that uh, uh, at, for the diagnosis of protein energy wasting, at least three of the following four categories must be positive. Specific biochemical measurements, such as low serum albumin or uh, prealbumin, also referred to as transthyretin, low body weight, reduced total body fat, or recent weight loss, uh, a decrease in muscle mass, and low protein or energy intake. Specific biochemical uh, measurements, as I mentioned, include serum albumin, transthyretin, other measurements for diagnosing protein waste uh, energy wasting include subjective global assessment, the malnutrition inflammation uh, score, um, in the a presence of inflammation as determined or indicated by high uh, serum high sensitivity C reactive protein, tumor necrosis factor alpha, interleukin 6, uh, ferritin levels. Uh, skeletal muscle strength or function, for example, there can be reduced hand grip strength, uh, decreased uh, uh, spontaneous gait speed, walking. Um, why are we so concerned about protein energy wasting? The reason is, is that it's associated with, um, with uh, increased mortality. This slide shows the relative risk of death in the uh, in uh, the general population and in chronic hemodialysis patients, according to the BMI of the individual. Now, if we focus first on the dark uh, purple line, one sees that as the BMI increases, the risk of death uh, rises rather uh, rather substantially. People also with very low BMIs also have an increased death rate. But look at the difference in patients with protein energy wasting. Um, the, uh, the lower the BMI, the greater the risk of death. And as the BMI increases, even to levels of morbid obesity, the relative risk of death uh, continues to fall. These data have been replicated in many studies. This is not an, uh, a, an outlier study 
but many studies show the the same uh, the same relationship. Very different, almost the mirror image of um, the normal relationship between body mass index and the relative risk of death. Not only this, but the effect of weight change over time on mortality has been shown to uh, um, uh, uh, be quite positive. Uh, if we look at the the triangle, the red line, which is the case uh, mix ad uh, adjusted um, for various uh, clinical and demographic factors, including age, sex, and also the malnutrition inflammation uh, uh, score, one sees that as weight loss increases, as there's weight loss, um, the risk of, uh, of a cardiovascular death goes up substantially. With weight gain, the risk of cardiovascular death actually falls below reference values. And furthermore, uh, this is compared to people with no weight change. And furthermore, this is independent of the patient's baseline body weight. So even a obese individual who gains weight uh, on chronic dialysis uh, uh, will tend to have less uh, risk of cardiovascular death, while the person who loses weight, even somebody who's obese, uh, uh, will in fact uh, have a greater risk of cardiovascular death. These data were obtained in almost 47,000 uh, patients undergoing maintenance hemodialysis. Now, this is a study uh, from, uh, excuse me, a, um, this is a study from uh, Japan, which shows that people uh, undergoing chronic dialysis in Japan with, uh, 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 with protein energy wasting indicating by the very heavy line um, have a much greater risk of death than uh, than do uh, people with uh, uh, without uh, protein energy wasting. Um, also, this is a study actually from Croatia, and in this study, the red color indicates a significantly um, uh, negative association be, uh, with survival whereas the blue line indicates a significantly positive relationship. And one sees that age, um, visceral fat, uh, uh, and, uh, our, uh, waist circumference are all associated uh, uh, with, uh, in, with reduced survival. The greater these values, for example, the greater the age, the greater the waist circumference, the greater the risk of, um, of, of death. And this is true in both chronic peritoneal dialysis patients as well as maintenance hemodialysis patients. On the other hand, those people who have a hand, increased hand grip strength, uh, 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 in, increased intercellular water, which is an indication of body cell mass, uh, uric acid, uh, fatty acid intake, sodium intake, uh, um, and on BMI, uh, BIA, bioelectrical impedance, uh, increased phase angle and increased serum albumin levels all have increased likelihood of, uh, of survival. Now, uh, why should sodium intake, uric acid, and fatty acid intake be associated with increased survival? Probably because these uh, parameters are affected by appetite. And the greater the appetite, uh, in general, the healthier the individual. Uh, we have uh, we have published data previously that people with uh, undergoing chronic hemodialysis who have anorexia or reduced appetite, as re as self reported, uh, have uh, increased uh, 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 serum pro inflammatory uh, cytokines, including increased uh, serum C reactive protein. So. Uh, High appetite is associated with less inflammatory markers, and that's probably why sodium intake, your acid levels, and fatty acid intake are correlated with increased survival. Now, um, uh, can, um, 
can protein energy wasting be successfully treated? Well, there are a number of questions uh, uh, um, underlying this uh, general question. And one is, uh, will it improve their protein energy status? There are a very large number of clinical trials indicating that treatment of protein energy wasting um, with nutritional support improves nutritional status of both advanced CKD uh, patients and patients undergoing maintenance dialysis. Uh, the evidence includes randomized prospective clinical trials, cross crossover studies, and four retrospective studies with match controls. Uh, this is a a, a list of uh, uh, of uh, randomized prospective control trials uh, and the relation the effect on on nutritional status. And one sees that the um, uh, that uh, and, and that the and these again are randomized prospective uh, clinical trials. You can see that um, in comparison to the control groups, those that received nutritional support in general demonstrated increased body weight, body fat, lean body mass, sometimes increased arm muscle circumference, serum albumin and uh, pre-albumin transthermin often increased. And one sees again a very commonly increase in albumin levels, and uh, uh, and and uh, uh, body mass. Now, it's interesting. We know that serum albumin is uh, strongly uh, affected by in inflammation; that it's a very sensitive marker of inflammation uh, where the serum albumin levels fall. But here you see that notwithstanding that relationship, then in these randomized control trials, those that received uh, nutritional support, in fact, demonstrated increase in serum in the serum albumin levels. Now, uh, <clears throat> these are more studies showing the same uh, the, 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 the same uh, phenomenon, um, uh, but also showing not only increase in uh, nutritional factors, including, again, serum albumin, total protein, but also uh, uh, quality of life and in, um, and in, uh, uh, <clears throat> and um, uh, with regard to mortality, we'll come to this in just a moment. Now, crossover trials show the, the same phenomena, that those who get, in fact, the treatment um, uh, during their treatment arm of their crossover trials showed, uh, again, increased nutritional status, body weight, arm circumference, normalization of many plasma amino acids, serum albumin levels often increased, decreased uh, fibroblast growth factor 23, more positive nitrogen balance was shown in uh, these uh, studies as well. Um, it, it, and now this is a uh, uh, this these data were taken from the Cochrane uh, Cochrane review by Bob Ma, in which he looked at the effect of serum albumin uh, 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 of nutritional support on uh, on serum albumin levels. And please note that the broken line here is a uh, shows an increase in serum albumin of about 0.2 gram per deciliter. This is the mean value. The average increase with these supplements in the people who have protein energy wasting undergoing hemodialysis, the average increase was 0.2. And if you look at no increase at all or uh, a fallen serum albumin, only a small number of these uh, clinical trials showed no increase uh, or a, in fact, a decrease. Almost all showed some increase and sometimes the rise in serum albumin levels was quite dramatic. Now, what about clinical outcomes? Will successful treatment of protein energy wasting improve clinical outcomes? Or is protein energy wasting essentially an epiphenomenon of superimposed diseases and aging, uh, such as aging, dialysis treatment, et cetera. And uh, the nutritional support has no effect, nor does the wasting have any effect on outcome. It's just 
an epiphenomena, a marker, if you will, of underlying uh, serious uh, diseases. So again, the question is, is protein energy wasting in itself a cause of the increased mortality, or is it just a marker of underlying diseases that, in, that increase fatality? And if you treat protein energy wasting, will that in itself improve clinical outcome? Well, these are uh, data. First of all, there are no large-scale randomized prospective controlled trials. But what there are are a number of uh, large-scale trials, which include um, in which uh, patients who received, uh, hemodialysis patients who received nutritional support were compared to uh, people who didn't receive it. And, uh, and in some studies, uh, the, there were uh, great effort was made to uh, ensure that the two groups of patients were in fact similar uh, clinically. In the very first study uh, of, of this type, uh, uh, published by Glenn Schertow and colleagues uh, almost 30 years ago now, um, 1,679 patients who received um, uh, intradilytic parental nutrition were compared to over 22,000 patients uh, who did not uh, and who were matched uh, by age, sex, uh, and uh, a variety of clinical disorders. What Chertow and coworkers found that uh, nutritional support was associated with greater survival in those with serum albumin of 3.3 gram per deciliter or lower. Capelli, in a much smaller study uh, examining intradilytic parental nutrition, again showed increased survival uh, in those who received uh, nutritional support. Again, increased survival means statistically significantly increased survival. Some of these studies that compared were, were actually rather small in, um, in value. There was uh, the study of pool did not have a control group, so there's no data as to uh, the effect on survival. Now, interestingly, some, uh, in some of these studies, an oral nutritional supplement was given. Uh, for example, the study of Laxon and coworkers. And again, they demonstrated increased survival. Weiner and associates again gave a nutrition supplement with oral nutritional um, uh, supplements during dialysis treatment and showed again, statistically significant decrease in mortality. And finally, Perez and Torres in the most recent study uh, treated, uh, uh, these are patients who were not undergoing dialysis. They were, uh, uh, they all had creatinine levels, as I'll come to, uh, creatinine clearances measured less than 20 cc per minute per 1.73 meters squared. And one notices again that, um, that there was uh, significantly increased nutritional status, decreased hospitalization rates, and probably decreased mortality. The p-value here was, uh, this is actually a, a typographical error, it's 0.051, not 0.51, but 0.051. And 25% uh, of these people received oral nutritional supplements. The, West, the rest received very special dietary uh, uh, counseling. Now, um, uh, the... Let, 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 let's uh, go now back uh, to these studies in more detail. And this is the first study by Chertow in which maintenance hemodialysis patients were treated at national medical care, now Fresenius dialysis units, uh, starting in January 1, 1991. I mentioned that 1679 patients received IDPN at least once and they were compared to over 22,000 patients who received no IDPN. on December 31, 12 months later, or had died during the year. Home hemodialysis and chronic peritoneal dialysis patients were excluded. Baseline data were the mean values during the six months before January 1st, 1991 for the control patients, and values as close to the start of IDPN for the IDPN-treated patients. The IDPN prescription duration and frequently, unfortunately, were unknown. Uh, the data were analyzed according to serum albumin and serum creatinine, 
and were adjusted for age, sex, race, the presence or absence of diabetes, and the type of kidney disease. Control and IDPN patients were followed for one year or until death. Now, in this retrospective unblinded study, IDPN was marginally associated with increased survival if serum albumin was a 3.4 gram per deciliter or less, and p-value was 0.1, but it was strongly associated with increased survival if the serum albumin was 3.3 gram per deciliter or less, point, uh, with a p-value of less than 0.01. At serum albumins of 3.5 gram per deciliter greater, IDPN was actually associated with reduced survival, especially if the serum craning was greater than eight milligrams per deciliter. Let me uh, show you the data in this slide. And here, the, again, uh, this outcomes were, uh, were broken down according to whether the serum creatinine was eight milligram per deciliter or greater, or excuse me, greater than eight milligram per deciliter or eight milligram per deciliter or less. And this shows the, uh, the, the, uh, the hazard um, 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 uh, uh, of, of dying during the, uh, uh, d during the time of treatment. Now, again, if the serum albumin was less, was 3.0 or less, there was a clear uh, reduction in mortality in those who received uh, IDPN. Uh, the, 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 the pale bars are those who received IDPN. The, uh, the, the darker bars are those, uh, the control patients. Um, when the serum albumin was 3 to 3.5, uh, in those with a creatinine of eight or less, there was still a significant, as indicated by the, um, the black uh, um, squares here, significant benefit. But when the serum albumin was 3.5 or greater, uh, there was actually a risk, an increased risk of death in those that uh, received IDPN. And you can see it for 3.5 to four or greater than four. Now, what's the significance, one might ask, of breaking the patients down into those with creatinine of eight or lower or greater than eight? Well, we know that people who serum creatinine is greater than eight, first of all, have greater survival than those who have lower these, again, are pre-dialysis uh, values than those who have lower serum creatinine. Also, uh, a, a higher creatinine is so associated not only with increased skeletal muscle mass, which is an indication of health, but also with increased um, uh, meat intake, strided muscle intake. And we know that, again, as I've mentioned earlier, uh, appetite is a sign of health. It's associated with less um, circulating uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines and less inflammation. Um, when sees the same data here, uh, this shows the, the, uh, the odds ratio of death in the patients according to the serum albumin level. And um, if it's 3.0 or less the serum albumin, a clear uh, benefit in terms of reduction odds ratio of death. And this uh, relationship continues uh, of nutritional support, IDP, and associated reduced mortality until one gets to a serum albumin of 3.4 gram per deciliter later. At this value, there's a trend, but not statistically significant. And when the serum albumin is 3.5 or less, there's absolutely no relationship between IDPN and survival. So IDPN in this study is only beneficial to those who have evidence of protein energy wasting. In summary, in this retrospective unblinded study, IDPN was marginally associated with increased survival if serum albumin was 3.4 gram per deciliter or lower and was strongly associated with increased survival if serum albumin was 3.3 grams per, less per deciliter or lower. At serum albumin levels of 3.5 gram per deciliter or greater, IDPN was associated with, inc with, uh, with reduced survival, especially if a serum creatinine was uh, greater than eight milligram per deciliter. Uh, um, uh, let's, let's go now to the study by Capelli and Associates. In this study, 50 patients 
received IDPN in 31 patients who did not serve these controls. Uh, these were patients that were living in uh, intensive care units, largely, and uh, 20 of the IDPN patients in significant at the 0.01 by Cox analysis. This uh, table shows the results. And um, it, with the total case caseload, there is a, uh, a 50 and 31 percent. There's a statistically significant difference, as I said, the less than 0.01 value of um, essentially 16.9 months per, uh, till death in the treated group and 7.5 months till death in the untreated group. That's the mean uh, survival. Uh, when one breaks it down, one sees a, a trend similarly in the both the diabetic patients um, and also uh, in the non-diabetic patients, particularly strong in the diabetic patients, but the, but the sample size when you break it down is so low that these values are not statistically significant. The... Uh, uh, now, um, well, I only mention this study because it's received a lot of attention. In this study, uh, the FINE study of patients undergoing chronic dialysis, those who received IDPN indicated by the gray line had no difference in survival uh, from those uh, who did, did not receive IDPN. They both had similar levels. Of, malnut uh, of malnutrition, uh, protein energy wasting. But there were several fundamental problems with this study. One was that um, all patients in both groups received oral nutritional supplements. So it was not just IDPN versus no IDPN. That was that all patients were already getting a nutritional treatment, nutritional support in the form of oral supplements. Also, the... Um, the amount of IDPN given, the amount of nutrition, and also the amount of oral nutrition varied from center to center. So there was no uh, uh, no clear understanding of the amount of nutritional support given to the people who did receive IDPN versus the people who did not. Um, now this is an oral supplement uh, uh, from a lax in coworkers. And the aim of this study was to examine whether oral nutritional supplements will improve survival and maintenance hemodialysis patients with protein energy wasting. Some patients in Fresenia, the Fresenius Medical Care in North America, dialysis units who had serum albumins of 3.5 gram per, per deciliter or lower, during the fourth quarter of 2009, were treated with oral nutritional supplements during hemodialysis treatments for one year. Uh, uh, again, this was given during that hemodialysis treatments or until the serum creatinine increased to four gram per deciliter or greater. Patients must not have received oral nutrition supplements during the 90 days prior to entering the study. Similarly, uh, hemodialysis patients who did not receive oral nutrition supplement, um, uh, but had serum uh, albumin of 3.5 gram per deciliter lower uh, served as control. So again, this is not a randomized uh, uh, controlled study. The patients were followed for 15 months. Patients were analyzed by intention to treat, uh, where some controls actually did begin oral nutritional supplements after the cutoff date. And uh, as and in as treated, where no control patients received, um, I'll call it ONS. And analysis were adjusted so that treated and controlled patients had similar baseline scores for factors that are likely to be associated with low serum albumin. So again, in the intention to treat, this must be emphasized, some patients actually did receive uh, oral nutritional supplements, ONS, after the cutoff date. So what did they find? Well, of the 31,000 patients that were eligible, uh, they found that um, they had 7,200 um, who received oral nutrition supplements and, um, and, and um, about uh, 21,000 uh, who did not. In the as-treated group, 
they compared 7,200 who received ONS to uh, essentially 14,000 that did not. The patients were matched so that the in the intention to treat, it was 5,200 in each group. And in the, um, the as treated group, there were 4,300 essentially in each group. Now this slide shows the uh, difference. This is the intention to treat group in those without in nutritional supplement with nutritional supplement. And you see that, you can see that the survival actually was lower in those that did not get ONS initially on that at, over a period of, um, after several months, the data, uh, the, the survivals became very similar. These values here are in fact are different. In the intention to treat, it's not intention to treat, in the actual as treated group, the B group, you can see there was a, there was in fact a significant difference in uh, with lower survival and those that did not receive uh, treatment throughout. Now, again, I want to emphasize that in the intention to treat, we know that some of the control patients did receive uh, ONS. So this slide shows the data in another way. This is the intention to treat patients, and this is unadjusted. This is adjusted for diabetes and significant other variables. And this is uh, completely uh, adjusted uh, for all the variables. <clears throat> and one can see uh, these little uh, uh, accent marks are indicate that there's a significantly uh, lower uh, death rate in those receiving ONS um, and uh, after uh, a, 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 some adjustment, uh, including for a diabetes and after a full adjustment. Uh, significant uh, reduction in mortality in those getting ONS. Uh, in the as-treated group, uh, where no patient who in the control received uh, uh, nutritional supplements, there was a much more dramatic uh, reduction in mortality with uh, 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 in those that received ONS, much more dramatic as compared to the intention to treat. Now, if one examines uh, the same data, but according to serum albumin, one sees that in intention to treat, if the serum albumin was 3.2 or lower, then <clears throat> there was a clear, uh, highly significant reduction in mortality um, in those that received ONS. Uh, in contrast, when the serum albumin was 3.2 to 3.4, or 3.4 to 3.5, there was no difference in survival. Um, in those getting uh, uh, in the in, in those assigned to not get ONS, but again, some of those assigned to not get ONS got it. If you look at actually those that were treated and did not get ONS, and those that were treated with ONS uh, compared to those who did not get ONS, <clears throat> that whether the serum albumin was three point two or lower, three point two, three point four. Or, or 3.4 to 3.5 or lower, when sees a, uh, a statistically, highly statistically significant uh, reduction in mortality in those with the nutrition, uh, who receive nutrition support. Um, now, um, in, now we go to another study, this one by Perez and Torres that was just uh, published uh, two years ago. And in this study, uh, 169 non-dialyzed advanced CKD patients were followed for two years. Creatinine clearances, these again were non-dialyzed patients, but creatinine clearances had to be less than 20 to be accepted into the study. Protein energy wasting was not necessarily present at the onset of the study. Now, 128 of these patients received very personalized new uh, nutrition. Uh, they enjoyed a nutrition education program where they were seen on four occasions by a specific, the same dietitian. And this dietitian designed a study that uh, a, a diet protocol which was designed for their specific needs according to whether they were obese or, or slender in terms of their energy intake, and that provided protein. Um, a substantial amount of which was, was of high biological value. Uh, the patients were counseled on how to do cooking, how to select foods in the marketplace, and oral nutritional supplements were given to about 25% of these patients. 45 patients who, do, who did not receive 
did not participate in the nutrition education program served as controls. This slide shows the results with regard to uh, uh, nutritional um, uh, uh, the nutritional status in those um, who received uh, uh, the nutrition education program. Uh, again, 25% with oral nutrition supplements uh, versus those who did not. And when sees that protein energy wasting at baseline uh, uh, fell um, um, uh, at, by, uh, by, uh, by six months in those who received the nutrition education program plus oral nutrition supplements, but, um, uh, and, uh, but even with nutrition education program by itself, these data are, um, are both uh, show significant reduction in protein energy wasting six months after the, uh, non, these non-dialyzed CKD patients entered the program. Now this uh, uh, slide shows mortality rate there, or if you turn it around the uh, survival, those that were still surviving uh, after um, after 24 months, uh, in those that received a participate in the nutrition education program, um, up here in the green line, and those that did not, as indicated by the uh, black line, and one sees that of those who received the uh, or participated in the nutrition education program, there was a substantially greater uh, um, uh, survival at 24 months. Now, uh, so in conclusion from this study, um, uh, oh, I, um, uh, maintenance, uh, from all of these studies, maintenance hemodialysis patients with serum albumin of 3.5 gram per deciliter lower has significantly greater 15 month survival when treated with ONS three times per week during dialysis. As treated analysis strengthened uh, these findings, the limitations of the study is that it was not a randomized perspective trial, and there may have been unrecognized differences between the treated and untreated controls that might have affected the outcome. For example, the physicians prescribing the oral nutrition supplements may have been more diligent in their treatment of other aspects of the patient's medical conditions. It is possible some control patients were taking unreported nutrition supplements, however, and this would tend to actually diminish differences in outcome between the control and treatment groups. So uh, the fact that some controls may have received nu nutritional supplements would make the highly significant differences that were found with the, in the Laxon study even more impressive. With regard to the Weiner study, this is another study maintenance hemodialysis patients treated in dialysis clinics who has serum albumins of 3.5 gram per deciliter were offered a 15 gram oral protein supplement uh, immediately before or during hemodialysis three times weekly. Patients could switch to another approved supplement if they desired. Supplements were stopped if serum albumin rose to four gram per deciliter or greater and could be restarted as serum albumin fell again to less than 3.5 gram per deciliter or, or lower. All cause mortality was compared in patients who started taking the supplement in September or October 2010 to patients who did not take the supplement. For this analysis, only hemodialysis patients who took the supplement and were treated in the dialysis units were greater than 10% of the patients who prescribed the supplement were compared to patients who were not prescribed the supplement and who were dialyzed in units where 10% of patients were prescribed the supplement. Some of the importance of this was to show that was that was to increase the likelihood that the patients um, who were taking the supplement were in, that were assigned to take the supplement were, were in fact likely to take it. The primary outcome was all cause mortality. Patients were censored at time of transplantation, changed in dialysis modality, or moved to a non-DCI um, uh, dialysis unit. <laughs> Mortality was ascertained through March 2012. This slide again shows the data in intention, intention to treat. Yeah, in the upper panel, 
and in the B panel uh, as treated. And one sees that there was a trend toward greater survival in those who received the nutrition support as compared to those that did not. Uh, and this difference was greater uh, in those who uh, uh, in those who uh, uh, actually received the support uh, compared to those who didn't. One sees also that there was a, this shows the rise in serum albumin levels in those receiving the nutrition support versus those that did not. And again, this, this difference was significant. And the difference uh, is also shown in the as treated group that those receiving nutrition support tended to have greater survival, although the difference here was less than the, those, uh, I'm sorry, greater serum albumin than those that did not receive nutrition. Now, <clears throat> this is another trial from the Davida uh, Dialysis uh, Centers in the United States. Uh, 3,300, almost 3,400 Davida patients with uh, serum albumin of 3.5 gram per deciliter or lower were prescribed ONS and 33, almost 3,400 propensity scored mass controlled hemodialysis patients uh, were used for comparison. There was a 69% reduction in deaths with the oral nutrition supplement uh, group uh, with a hazard ratio of mortality of 0.31 and 33% fewer missed dialysis treatments versus controls. During follow-up, in the oral nutrition support treaty group, serum albumin was lower, and uh, the NPNA, the NPCR, and post dialysis patients were higher compared to the control groups. And this study shows the proportion of patients uh, who survived. And uh, the broken line indicates the those who received um, um, uh, uh, no oral nu nutritional supplement, and the solid black line shows that those that did, showing again uh, less, um, excuse me, less, uh, less mortality in those that received the oral nutrition supplements. And th this, these data, this shows the same data according uh, to uh, the mistreatment. Those that received oral nutrition supplements had um had uh, 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 less mistreatments. Uh, one has to say that one of the limitations in this study is that it's possible that those who received oral nutrition supplements were more motivated to come to dialysis treatments and uh, and therefore, because they had le fewer mistreatments that this might have been a reason for the greater uh, the, the greater survival with the oral nutrition supplements. On the other hand, it's also possible that by getting oral nutrition supplements, the patients felt better and therefore were more likely uh, to attend to the dialysis treatments. Uh, the study that was not able to distinguish between these possibilities. So in summary, protein energy wasting is common in non-dialyzed advanced CKD patients and in patients undergoing chronic dialysis. Although protein energy wasting has many causes, it is often treatable, especially with nutrition, nutritional therapy. Although there are no randomized control, uh, respective control trials, uh, five, really six now, retrospective analysis involving relatively large numbers of hemodialysis patients have examined survival of hemodialysis patients who received either IDPN or oral nutrition supplements in comparison to hemodialysis patients who did not. In these studies, the nutritionally treated patients were matched to the control untreated patients using such methods as propensity scores. Of, it's actually now five of the six patients showed a statistically significant, the greater rise in serum albumin, and all five studies showed reduction in all-cause mortality in the hemodiasis patients with protein education who received nutritional support, actually all six studies. Because these were not randomized prospective control trials, conclusions regarding the value of nutritional therapy in these patients must be made with some caution. The risk of unidentified or identified confounders that may have biased results in these studies is not small. Perhaps one of the greatest potential confounders 
is that physicians who provided nutritional therapy to the patients may have been more aggressive or meticulous in other aspects of their treatment of their patients. And this and this greater attention to other aspects of their illnesses may have caused the patient's increased survival. Also, there may have been a publishing bias against studies that were negative or that showed worse outcomes in patients receiving nutritional support. Nonetheless, it is striking that six out of six uh, studies indicated increased survival in hemodialysis patients with protein energy wasting and received nutritional therapy, and no large-scale studies showed no effect on survival or demonstrated reduced survival with nutritional therapy. Hence, it can be argued that advanced CKD patients and maintenance hemodialysis patients with protein energy wasting should receive nutritional therapy, at least until other studies, and particularly randomized prospective controlled clinical trials, indicate that this treatment is not helpful or is actually harmful. Again, there were some studies that showed that if the patients did not have substantial protein energy wasting, or at least a serum albumin of 3.4 or 3.3 gram per deciliter or lower, that nutritional support was not helpful and might have been harmful. So again, we're it's been it's being recommended only for people who have evidence of protein energy wasting. Um, now, I'd like to take just a moment to talk about another aspect of nutritional support of uh, in the hemodialysis patients. And that's the value of eating uh, during uh, dialysis treatment. Uh, the, um, there, uh, there are many parts, this is a very controversial question and there, there are many parts of the world where patients will deliberately not be fed during dialysis uh, because uh, of the um, finding that there can be a postprandial decrease in blood pressure during hemodialysis with increased risk of symptomatic intradialytic hypotension, which is associated with increased mortality. Hypotension or risk of decreased blood pressure can reduce, lead to reduce uh, hemodialysis dose because the nurses will cut down dialysis uh, flow rate, the blood or the dialysate flow rates until, particularly dialysate flow rates until the blood pressure um, uh, returns to uh, or, or close to baseline values. Of note uh, is that eating one to two hours before, the, before studying hemodialysis provides nutrients to plasma without causing interdialytic hypotension at or just after the time that hemodialysis begins depleting nutrients, nutrients intracellularly. Uh, to say this a little differently, um, we know that gastric emptying is delayed in hemodialysis patients. And therefore, if one feeds the patient an hour or two before they begin dialysis, uh, which is a time normally when, uh, during dialysis, when the blood pressure tends to fall, you can give the nutrients which start to actually enter the bloodstream, much of which enter the bloodstream after the patients start dialysis treatment, and the risk of uh, hypotension induced by the uh, food should be lower. No, no patient, no, no randomized perspectives trial has actually examined the long-term outcomes of oral feeding and dialysis, however. Um, this slide summarizes the data um, for, uh, from these studies, and you can see that many of these studies um, uh, in many of these studies, uh, there's a reduction in blood pressure that occurs um, postprandially after the patients eat. And the actually incidence of intradilytic hypotension is actually increased. It's not shown in all studies, but all studies tend to have a reduction in blood pressure. And you can see that it occurs early on, within uh, 45 minutes to two hours of uh, of the onset of dialysis, which again could be an argument for feeding the patients before they start dialysis treatment. It makes an hour or two starting before. Now, in this regard, uh, Connie Ree uh, uh, from uh, Los Angeles and co-workers 
uh, recently published uh, the Freddie trial. In this study, 110 adult uh, maintenance hemodialysis patients with serum albumins less than four were randomized to meals providing either 50 to 55 gram protein, 850 calories, 400 to 500 milligrams of phosphorus, and uh, a phosphate binder, 0.5 to 1.5 grams of uh, lanthanum carbonate, or to a meal composed of less than one gram protein, less than 50 calories, less than 20 milligrams of phos phosphorus, and phosphorus binders as needed. Meals were given during the first 60 minutes of each hemodialysis treatment for eight weeks. So they received, since they were dialyzed three times a week, they received 24 meals, each of the patients. The key outcome was the increase in serum albumin of 0.2 gram per deciliter or greater and a serum phosphorus that did not rise, that, but that rain, remained between 3.5 and less than 5 milligram per deciliter. The results of the study excuse me, the results of the study showed that 27% of treatment group 15, versus 15% 15 of controls attained the key outcome. And this is significant at the P less than 0.05. Also, serum interleukin-6 increased in 9% of the treatment groups versus 31% of the controls. Um, and this was highly significant, P less than 0.00 or equal to 0.009. Serum parathyroid level, hormone levels at the end of study was 505 uh, in the, um, uh, the, uh, the food supplement group versus 330 uh, in the controls. And this was significantly uh, different, these two values. There were no severe or non-severe adverse effects reported in either group. So, my suggestion for a way of handling uh, food intake in relation to hemodialysis is as follows. Gastric emptying is delayed in end-stage renal disease patients, especially during a hemodialysis session. An average of roughly 70 to 75% of an, of an ingested mixed meal is still in the stomach after two and a quarter hours of ingesting the meal, which indicates that... Uh, <clears throat> the, perhaps the best time to feed the patient is before they begin dialysis. Therefore, I propose that patients should be fed a nutritious meal about 60 minutes before the onset of their hemodialysis session. This should reduce or prevent in, extracellular and intracellular depletion of amino acids during the hemodialysis session, which does happen um, routinely in patients who are hemodialyzed and uh, do not eat during the dialysis, uh, during or immediately before dialysis. So this should uh, uh, prevent or, re uh, or reduce amino acid depletion and promote protein synthesis during hemodialysis, as Kistler has shown, and also should reduce uh, the risk of intradialytic hypotension. And I'd like to thank you very much for your kind attention uh, to my presentation. Thank you so much, Professor Koppel. Uh, Dina, would you like to, you know, take everyone through the question and answers, please? Thank you very much, Professor Koppel, for this very illustrative uh, lecture. And um, I believe that we will need to hear more and more about the nutrition and nutrition in the kidney disease in the coming um, months. So, um, start with because we have some questions that we will um, forward to you but to start with how far should the nephrologists be involved in the nutrition of the kidney patients um it, 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 well i'm of the opinion that it's essential uh let, let me say a little differently <clears throat> uh our fellows, when they're learning to become nephrologists, are focused on the use of dialysis to remove toxins from the patient. Um, 
they're looking at ways to remove it. There are they are aware that valuable nutrients are also removed by dialysis. But I keep pointing out to them that our job as nephrologists is not to just be concerned with what's removed, but also be concerned with what should be added to the patient. I'm interested in the 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 word that's used is French word, the interior milieu of the patient and what actually is going on inside the patient's body. I'm not just concerned with what's being removed. I want to know what's going into the patient as well. If you want to make a person healthy, you're obviously going to be concerned not just by, by what's being lost or what's not being lost, but you want to know what's going into the patient. So in my opinion, you have to be concerned with the nutrient intake of a patient. There, there is no nephrologist, in my opinion, even those who deny any interest in nutrition, who doesn't spend some time on the nutritional management of the patient, if nothing else with regard to their phosphorus intake and sodium and potassium intake. But it makes no sense not to be concerned about the intake of other nutrients, including their energy sources, uh, the protein amino acid intake. So my, this is a long, to give the answer succinctly, I think a nephrologist is obligated to be concerned with the nutrition of their patients. And particularly because, as I just showed, that every study that's evaluated this, that has any, that has a control group, shows that that when people develop protein energy wasting, that if you treat them with nutrition, you reduce their death rate. So how how can a doctor not be interested in the patient's nutritional status if we know that wasting is associated with increased mortality and that if you provide nutrition, you can reduce that mortality? I mean, I totally I totally agree. And maybe this is the message here that all the nephro nephrologist has to be so concerned about the nutrition of uh, the kidney patients. And during the routine visits, this has to be assessed regularly. And the treatment is not one for all. And as you mentioned through your uh, lecture, that even going giving the sup supplements for those who do not need it might not be beneficial or might be a bit harmful for them. So the nutritional assessment and the wasting assessment should be a routine part of the patients in a nephrologist clinic. Um, so maybe we can move on to some uh, questions. And should, uh, I, should I open the questions uh, here? Uh, um, uh, yeah. can, you, can you see the question and answer? Well, uh, would you like me to kind of read the question and then at least give my response uh as you like okay and oh, also we the, have uh, with us uh professor uh, Hany Hawkes from Egypt from professor of uh, nephrology in Cairo University he wants to ask us something and professor Hany is currently the president of the Afran the African Renal Association and um, he's a professor in Cairo University as he's been my professor and my mentor for more than 25 mm -hmm. years. So well, let's welcome uh, Professor Henny and I will try to allow him. Yeah. Uh, professor Henny, are you with us? Hello? Maybe he's disconnected now. Okay. Professor Hany, are you with us? Um, I, I can tell you that when I joined, I had a little trouble too. So the professor may have okay. be having so trouble. Uh, um, maybe we can start with the questions till we solve this uh, this problem. Uh, would you like to read the question, uh, Dina? Would you prefer that I do it? Okay. Okay. 
So we've got a question here from Jude. If leptin, the appetite suppressing substance gets cleared during dialysis, will it increase the appetite? Well, first of all, I'm trying to remember what the molecular weight of leptin is, and I, I don't think it's very well cleared. I think it, it's, the molecule is too large. But I, I can just tell you that, that experientially, um, uh, patients don't describe a improvement in appetite immediately after a dialysis treatment, if that's what you're referring to. So immediately after dialysis, you don't see an improvement in appetite. On the other hand, there have been a number of studies that have looked at nutritional status during the first six to 12 months after starting hemodialysis. And in general, the protein energy status of the patient does improve. That that's We actually, uh, Dr. Rajneesh Marotra and I published on this, but so a number of other people and we showed increase in serum albumin level, often body weight increases. And I think the reason for this is that, that um, patients um, are, uh, uh, patients, the vast majority of patients lose weight during the months before they start dialysis treatment. And I think they lose weight because they're quite uremic. The more uremic than the, than the healthcare team recognizes, the patient himself or herself may not realize how uremic they are because it, it kind of often creeps up on them gradually in people with chronic kidney disease. And I've had many patients tell me after their first or second dialysis, they say, my God, I didn't realize how badly I felt before I started dialysis treatment. This is very typical. So uh, in answer to the, to the question, I think dialysis does not may not immediately improve appetite in somebody who's established on chronic dialysis, but dialysis does remove a number of toxins which are which are, are appetite suppressing. So uh, it may not your appetite may not improve after one dialysis when you're it should be after each dialysis when you're already on dialysis treatment, but but. But in general, appetite does improve in people after they start their dial their chronic dialysis treatments. I, I hope that answers the question. Okay. Uh, so, uh, Professor Henny, are you with us now? Something wrong. Okay. So the next question is from um, Abdul Hamid, and he had he has three questions. He's asking about the protein intake in proteinuric and non-CKD patients, and the protein intake in um, hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis patients, and the value of anti-inflammatory drugs like interleukin one and six blockers in such patients. Well, um, if I uh, um, let me start with the first, the top question first. Uh, George Kaysen, um uh, has shown very clearly that uh, when a patient um, is proteinuric, um, particularly if it's nephrotic range proteinuria of three grams per day or more in the urine, but any proteinuric patient almost, that the more protein you eat the more protein they lose in the urine. So if a person has, let's say, uh, 400 milligrams of per day of urinary protein, uh, eating a, a high protein diet is not going to materially increase the urine protein. But if somebody puts out four or five grams a day and you eat, uh, let's say, um, um, 80 or 100 grams of protein, 120 grams of protein, um, the end result in uh, as published by George Kaysen, is that you'll excrete more protein in, in your urine and your serum protein does not actually increase. So <clears throat> what um, what he recommends and which, which I would support is, uh, is that um, in people who are proteinuric uh, uh, is to use um, 
angiotensin receptor blockers or, or, or ACE inhibitors uh, in order to suppress the proteinuria and, and also to reduce the rate of rise if one gives more protein. And what I what I will do is I'll give um, the amount of protein uh, 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 that I that I think a patient who's not, will need if they're not if they're not proteinuric, for example, point six to point eight gram per uh, grams protein per kilogram per day, and then I'll give them uh, gram for gram additional protein up to about to roughly five grams of additional protein per day. So. What does one do if a patient has 15, 20 grams, or let's say 10 to 15 grams of protein? I don't know whether the patient should receive uh, increase, um, uh, how much increased protein they should receive. I think it's clear that they should be receiving an ACE inhibitor or an ARB, or maybe even a aldosterone receptor antagonist if, if they can tolerate that. But uh, what do you do with a patient who excretes 20 or 30 grams or, or 35 grams of protein per day. Some of these people, I've actually ablated their kidneys. And the simplest way to do it is I've given them non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs like indomethacin, and, and uh, that, that can actually cause anuria in some people with, let's say, a GFR of four or five cc per minute who are excreting huge amounts of protein in 25, 30 grams of protein per day. And this amount of protein loss actually can turn a patient into an invalid. Um, so I, I, I don't think it's a small issue, but that's not the usual case. The usual amount of protein loss, obviously, we all know this is less than that. And so I use a combination of a medicine that may suppress protein excretion in the urine, and I'll go up to maybe five grams or so above what I think is the patient's uh, um, required intake if they didn't have uh, proteinuria. With regard to the protein intake in maintenance hemodialysis and chronic peritoneal dialysis patients, there was uh, it was published about two years ago. <clears throat> the KDOKI guidelines came, revised guidelines came out with the new recommendations for dietary uh, protein intake of non-dialyzed and dialyzed and transplanted uh, people with kidney disease. And uh, for maintenance hemodialysis in peritoneal patients, it runs what they recommend. What they recommend is about 1.0 to 1.2 gram per kilogram per day. About closer to 1.2 if the patient is a diabetic. Uh, um, the KDGO is coming out with some recommendations very shortly. They're actually. The, the comment period for those recommendations just ended. I can tell you that uh, some of the recommendations are quite controversial and um, uh, people who are involved, nephrologists who are involved with the International Society for Renal Nutrition Metabolism actually have been critical of some of those recommendations. So whether those recommendations will be modified, I don't know. I just know that, that those criticisms were delivered and uh, during the uh, comment period, and we'll see what the, I don't know what the end result will be yet, but those will be published probably in the next um, one to four months. Um, our anti-inflammatory and IL-6, IL-1 and 6 blockers of, of value, mm -hmm. um, uh, I think, I, I think first of all, these, IL-6 particularly, I think, is, is does many harmful things to the body. It it um, it, it it causes it's a catabolic agent. It it <clears throat> it, it causes anorexia, uh, and I think um, if the if uh, depending on the side effects of the anti-inflammatory drugs, I think it would be worth a trial uh, of them. I'm not aware of any published data showing what the uh, end results are. They may be, maybe I've just missed that literature uh, and maybe somebody else in the, uh, on the panel would like to comment on that. I, I think that, I think theoretically th um, that's a very appropriate type of treatment, but whether it's been demonstrated yet to be clinically effective, uh, I, I, don't, I don't know. Now, why feeding during the first hour of dialysis? Uh, uh, 
uh, again, I think um, I think there are pros and cons. The the pro, as I mentioned, if you look, <clears throat> and we published extensively on this. If you look at the, if a person is fasting, if you look at the drop in plasma amino acid levels during dialysis, <clears throat> and if you look at the um, the amount of amino acids removed during a hemodialysis treatment, it's very clear that much of the amino acids that are removed are coming from within the cell. They're not just coming from the extracellular space because the drop in the plasma values uh, cannot account for the amount of amino acids that are actually found in the dialysate if they're measured. And um, uh, Alpa Kistler has shown very, very nicely that this is associated, this loss is associated with a catabolic, a protein catabolic state. And that if you give, in, if you give a nutrition support either intravenously or orally during the dialysis treatment, you can reverse this. You can prevent the catabolic response and the patient can actually can be made anabolic actually during dialysis. He's published very nice papers on that. Now, uh, given the high incidence of protein energy wasting, I think this is something that we can't ignore. So I'm of the opinion that pe people need to be fed around the time of dialysis. But as I said in my presentation, that given the fact that protein uh, emptying from the stomach, excuse me, that gastric emptying is delayed in almost all chronic dialysis patients, I'm of the opinion that you, and given the fact that intradialytic hypotension uh, not rarely occurs if you feed the patient during dialysis, I'm of the opinion that we should be feeding the patient just before they go on dialysis, let's say an hour before, um, because most people who become hypotensive do it very shortly do it within usually within an hour or a little more than an hour after after they eat. So if you feed them an hour, maybe an hour and a half before dialysis, uh, they won't become they should not become hypotensive during dialysis. On the other hand, much of the nutrients that are that the patient eats are not going to be absorbed until the patient is on dialysis because the stomach empties so much more slowly. So uh, to me, this would be the best solution is to feed the patient maybe an hour, hour and a quarter, hour and a half before they start dialysis treatment. Will this make a difference in terms of protein energy wasting? Well, as I mentioned, uh, Connie Rhee in a recent publication of the Freddy study suggests that you'll end up with a higher serum albumin after eight weeks. So this, in, in comparison to control patients. So this suggests that perhaps it is a... Um, it, it is a uh, a very worthwhile endeavor. Anyone Thank in you. the panel want to do make any have, comments? Dina, we have, we have time thing? for a couple more questions from Dr. Tarun and Dr. Mohammed. Okay. Uh, and I see someone is raising hands. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Tarun would like to know, uh, first we'll go on to Dr. Mohammed's question. I think he has put it in the chat box. Yeah. And Okay. So... Can you read it out? Uh, he's with us, so uh, it's he's not able to come on. I think is he? Oh, he has come on now. Maybe he can. I, see. I, I see. I see, Doctor Professor Heifetz. Uh, how are you? How are you, sir? Well, I, uh, I think your me, mute. Maybe your mute, mute, mute is it. on. We cannot hear you. Okay. Okay. Maybe so Professor Henry was asking about the prevalence of frailty in the Western registries, the USRDS and the European. The, the prevalence to, of to the, third so the prevalence of, of what? Frailty. Frailty. Frail. Oh, frailty. Yes. Frailty. frailty. Pardon me. <clears throat> yes, I, 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 actually. Uh, uh, tended to stay away from that in this lecture. Um, the, the the prevalence of frailty is actually, it depends, first of all, on the age of the population, of the dialysis population. 
um, the older the, the dialysis population, the more common it is. Frailty actually was originally described um, uh, by um, uh, in in the elderly people. It was originally uh, gerontologists who actually uh, um, addressed the question of frailty. And it's a very, very important question because we know that people who are frail uh, die, uh, have a much higher mortality rate. In fa and, 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 and this is true not only of the elderly, it's also been shown very, very clearly now that this is also true in chronic dialysis, hemodialysis patients. And in fact, the latest study on this um, involving between 900 and 1,000 uh, 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 I believe they were chronic dialysis, it was advanced CKF chronic dialysis patients, was just published in the last two or three or four weeks in um, uh, by um, Marcelo Tonelli from Canada. Just, it just came out uh, quite recently. And again, showing that frailty is associated with a much higher uh, mortality rate. Now, um, the... the um, the, the question is, um, uh, what can be done about it? Can you treat frailty? And if you treat it, does that change uh, survival? Uh, and uh, first, uh, it depends upon the cause of frailty. Uh, in my opinion, uh, a major cause of it is the fact that people don't exercise regularly. Uh, I, I think that's uh, that's true of everybody, not just CKD patients. And my own experience is that <clears throat> that once a person becomes, once a CKD patient becomes frail, that your ability to reduce that, that frailty with exercise, that's assuming that all the comorbid conditions are more or less controlled. If they're a diabetic, it's under re relative good control. But if once a person becomes frail, if they've got any comorbid conditions or, or just if they're very elderly, your ability to reverse that frailty is very limited. You can make progress, there's no question. And interestingly, in our experience, um, even two, after just two or three exercise sessions, exercise training sessions, a patient's exercise capacity begins to increase. But in terms of bringing a person back to normal, I think that's extremely unlikely, at least by the techniques that we know today. Maybe there are combinations of treatment that have not really been explored, for example, using uh, exercise training plus uh, a good protein energy intake plus maybe giving people testosterone or insulin-like growth factor one or, 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 or growth hormone or some combination of these anabolic factors, uh, maybe that will do it. But the reason that I'm, I'm focusing on this is to say that the most important way to, that, to manage frailty is to prevent it with exercise training. And we need to put this on people's radar I would just challenge everybody listening to this uh, webinar, uh, just ask yourself how often when you see a new CKD patient, how often do you discuss exercise training with that patient? I do. I do it routinely because that's a focus of mine. And incidentally, I've been exercising regularly since I was about 11 years old. Uh, but uh, but the, the issue is to, they need to build themselves up before they develop end-stage kidney failure. And certainly, I'll tell you something else that I do with my CKD patients, particularly as they're approaching dialysis. I tell these people, if you're thinking of making a major investment or changing or starting a new business, talk to me before you do that, that I'm not qualified to decide whether it's a good business venture or not. But I am qualified to make a pretty good educated guess as to whether you will have the energy and the time to manage that investment. 
something like off the walls, like something stupid. But I have, if you talk with enough patients, I have seen patients who have invested heavy, they, they invested their life savings just before they ended up with end stage kidney failure and they could not manage the business. They lost everything. They lost their, their whole, their lives were essentially destroyed. First, they had to deal with dialysis treatment. And then on top of that, they, they, they had become impoverished because they had sunk all their money into a business which required their day-to-day -day attention. So if our job as healthcare workers is to relieve pain and suffering, then I think it's critical that we remember that we remember that people don't have our perspective. They'll make decisions unaware, perhaps, of how their forthcoming end-stage kidney failure is going to impact on their uh, on their ability to manage um, new investments or new ventures. It's our job to at least advise them is the, what the, what their physical and emotional stamina is going to be over the forthcoming months to the best of our ability. I, I, I've seen what happens when this doesn't happen. And I'll tell you something else too. This happens to some of the patients probably who are of doctors that are on this call. It's just the patients don't discuss this with the doctors. Patients are often afraid to talk about issues in their lives that they don't think are direct, directly related to their health care. So they, they, we may be having, what I'm describing may be more common than is recognized because people don't talk about this to their doctors. Anyway, something to think about. Yeah. And this was about, actually the second part of Professor Zhani's question about the value of the gym and the sauna to improve the frailty and maybe improving the appetite of the patients. So Dina, we have time for one more question from Dr. Um, Tarun, and then we'll wind well, up. Well, I, I just have a couple uh, um, who were raising their hands for a quite long time. So uh, I think that was done by mistake, actually. So we have now Araso. Um, so I, I I can answer this question by um, Dr. Saha, okay. if I may. And that is, I think, the, the uh, uh, people have not looked at the relationship between high serum CRP per se and um, the effect of nutritional supplements with regard to patient survival. But I can tell you this, that a very large proportion of people with protein energy wasting have elevated CRP values. And as I've said, study after study shows that nutritional support of these people does improve survival. So um, I would, and also raise the serum albumin levels. And as you know, serum albumin is exquisitely sensitive to inflammation. Even minor amounts of inflammation will drop the albumin value. And serum, and we've seen that giving serum, uh, giving nutritional support, commonly, even in randomized prospective studies of people with protein energy wasting, serum albumin commonly increases in the the uh, group that received nutritional support. So I would contend that almost certainly, I would think that at least some patients with elevated CRP. Um, can can uh, have improved survival uh, with nutritional support. Yes. So, Dina, you know, we're running out of time. Can we uh, finish with one question? Uh, do we still have more questions? I think we have uh, answered all the questions here. Uh, so, for those raising hands, do you want? Well, I, I don't think, I think that was done by mistake. So maybe you could, uh, uh, you know, okay. conclude now and then we can ask Dr. Alessandro to say a few words. Okay. So uh, I think now we can, we can conclude this uh, session and thank you very much, Professor Cooper, for this very interesting and very important topic that you have 
given of given us the time and the chance to share to share it with us today and actually this is a very very important topic that's usually overlooked by many nephrologists all over the world and nutrition of the patients uh, is important and as the medications that they are prescribed and we have to always emphasize on the importance to follow up the wasting and the follow up the nutrition of our patients regularly uh, in our clinics. So thank you very much and allow us to invite you more to our uh, meetings because um, we will always need you and need your support with us. And uh, thank you for all uh, for everyone who has been attending. A special thanks to Professor Hani Hafez for joining us today. And we're very sorry that there is a problem with the voice, but we can see you clearly. <laughs> um, and uh, for Alessandro Nero. I have a question, first of all, for Joel. What okay. about the lab dosage about albumin? I mean, since you quoted from the different studies, the difference when you have an album is 3.2, 3.3, and then 3.5, but not to uh, this pass, so not to go over four. So I think it's very important the dosage of albumin. There are different lab methods uh, with the bromocrystal, green or blue, or with the moon, I say. Can you hear me, Joel? Uh, I can. Madeline, can you shut that door? I can't hear. Um, go ahead, I can hear you now. Okay, okay, I, I start again. Now, I was worried about the lab method of dosage of about albumin, since there are different methods and the result can move from one value to the other. And we had a very narrow limit. I mean, uh, it must be 3.2, 3.3, and not 3.5, it's quite different. So we have different methods about with the bromocresol, with moon assay, and some others. So I would like to know your opinion about this. And then I have also a comment about the feeding in hemodialysis. You know very well that many years ago was strictly forbidden to, to eat during dialysis completely due to the risk of nausea and vomiting and hypotension. And then thing has changed but this changed because it's a public habit to encourage and to keep life better even during the dialysis session. I remember it was completely forbidden to, to watch the TV. Now everybody looks <laughs> at the, his computer now during the hemodialysis and eating this the sandwich in the morning at probably the wrong time because the administration decided to bring to the dialysis patient uh, 11 o'clock in the morning to bring to bring food or to bring sandwiches and so on. So I think it's bad habit that should be opposite by the doctors. That's my opinion. And what about the albumin ratio and dosage? Well, um, you raise a good question. Um, and uh, the... Uh, the to the best of my recollection, none of, none of the studies that uh, compared the response um, uh, according to the patient's serum albumin described how albumin was measured. However, uh, the standard way stud in hospitals in the United States, and most of these studies came out of the United States, I think virtually all of them, well, not all, but most of them did, um, uh, is using a, it's a it's a dye binding method like brome crystal green or brome crystal purple, and the reason that those methods are used is because they're cheap and 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 fast, uh, as opposed to, for example, uh, compared to for example nephilometry. So um, uh, now nephilometry measurements of albumin usually end up giving lower values than the same specimen would. I would give using these dye binding methods. So what to do about this? I would just say that, um, uh, uh, you know, you I guess one way is to just check the way albumin is measured in your lab. I would guess that probably in most parts of the world, uh, it's dye binding 
when I say dye, it's D-Y-E binding methods are still used. And they won't, even though different dyes are used, such as brome crystal green, brome crystal purple, I don't, that won't make much difference at all, if any. Uh, so uh, if you use nephilometry, uh, then you might pick a slightly lower cutoff, maybe half a, 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 a instead of maybe 3.3 uh, 3 or lower, 3.4 or lower, maybe it would be 3.35 or 3.25 or lower. But I wouldn't make any more. That would be about the maximum of the adjustment that I would make, at least until there's more data available. But maybe I can ask you about Italy and Egypt. Is it usually, do you guys, uh, do your hospitals use a dye binding method for measuring albumin? In Italy, you have, yes. You know? yeah. Mostly yeah. The, the green bromocrosol. Yeah, yeah. So uh, these data would be, therefore, I think, completely applicable to, to your hospital labs. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Joel. It was a wonderful day. We we are here since almost two hours, so this makes a very good result. And we hope to have you again on IFKF uh, since you were the founder of AFKF uh, very soon. Thank you to you and to everybody. Bye-bye. I'd thank like you. to thank you as well. It was a, a privilege and an honor uh, to give this talk. So thank you so much. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Dr. Alessandro. Th thank you, Dina. Thank you, Kausilya and Dr. Muruganathan Tangaraj and everybody who has been part of this program and all our viewers and participants and our attendees. Grateful thanks to all of you. Look out for more. We're going to have more on the kidney healthcare best practice uh, approaches. So we want you all to be part of every program. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank bye. you. Bye-bye. Good night and good morning and good afternoon. Bye-bye. <laughs> good day.